Strange, but true stories. Tales from the light side, the dark side, and the other side. I am Steve White. Like a lot of people, I'm a Stephen King fan. His latest book, published by Hard Case Crime, is titled Later. The main character is a little boy who can see dead people and talk to them for a short period of time after they have died. No spoilers here. As I'm recording this, I'm only about 40 pages in. But it's a good read, and it's received some really good reviews. Anyway, today's SBT is sort of along those lines. There are two stories here from subscribers of SBT, just like you, that sent along their stories of growing up with entities in their house. There was a communication between them and the world beyond. The first story was sent to us by a young woman who had some very interesting experiences with her ghostly friend. I grew up on a farm in southwest Missouri. The nearest town only had about a thousand people or so. My mom always told me that I was a lively baby and a child with an active or overactive imagination. She would say I would just laugh and coo in my crib by myself all the time. When I got older, I told her I had a friend named Mary and she liked to wear an apron. My parents thought it was cute and thought I got the idea for my friend from... Beauty and the Beast, as I love that movie, and Belle wore an apron for most of the movie. I knew Mary was different, but we still talked from time to time. I continued to tell my parents what she looked like, and other things. And then one night, I heard my mom screaming. I ran into the living room, and my mom is just pointing, asking my dad over and over again if he can see that little girl. Well, I could. It was Mary. My dad could not see her. We turned back around and Mary was gone. Over the years, I saw less of her and she never spoke to me anymore, but I would have dreams about loved ones and others who had passed and the dreams became so common my parents were afraid I was lying or possibly having sleep paralysis. Mary would be in my dreams sometimes, but I still hadn't seen her in a long time. Then one Christmas Eve, I heard whispering and thought it was Santa Claus or an elf or something. So, of course, I wanted to catch them in the act. I ran down from my room again, only to see Mary by the tree, just staring at a present. It was from Santa, and I rubbed my eyes and poof, she was gone again. I ran back to my room quickly. She made several more appearances, but I never really felt afraid of her. Just, you know, spooked a little, but not like I was in danger. She would take things, and then we would find them in the middle of the room in places that there was no way we would have missed them when we were looking for them. One evening, I thought my mom was up late in the computer room, and I wanted to sneak on my social media to check to see if a boy had DM'd me back. I crept up on the door and looked in, and... My mom was not there, but the keys were clicking. And then all of a sudden, the chair spun around, and everything stopped. I don't know why, but I spoke out loud and said, It's okay, Mary, it's only me. I was too spooked to go in there, and as I turned around, I once again heard the click-click of the computer keyboard. If I couldn't find something, I could honestly just ask, and if Mary had it, she would bring it back, and it was always in a place that I would have seen while looking for it. TV remotes, makeup, toys, books, they're all things she would play with. As my older sister and younger brother got older, soon the house was filled with friends and girlfriends and boyfriends. One night my older sister and her boyfriend were sitting in his truck until my sister absolutely had to come inside to make her curfew. But this night was a little bit different. We heard a loud scream and... He jumped out of his truck and slammed the door. He said he saw a little girl in our upstairs window. We calmed him down and explained that it was Mary. He accepted the explanation of who Mary was, but I could tell he didn't really believe what we were telling him. My father refused to believe any of it until one day a close family friend of his came up to him in town and said, We need to talk. 
Now, my son and his friend were driving around this weekend. You know, remember small town, so driving around, killing time, quite normal. And he was with his friend and his, his friend's stepdad. Now, the stepdad believes he's a medium, and he drove around all the time trying to pick up on things. They happened to drive by your house, and the stepdad yelled, Stop! And he pointed at your house, and he said, There's a little girl there, and something is keeping her there. Now, my dad's friend and his son had heard all the stories that we had told over the years about our little girl ghost. It freaked them out, and even made my dad eh, begin to believe us a little bit. Now, the only place in my house growing up that ever gave me bad vibes was the staircase. I had broken my ankle on them as a kid and just figured that I was mentally scarred from that fall. And then one night, I was in high school, I had a dream, and in that dream, Mary told me to stay off the stairs. I hadn't seen her in so long at this point. Well, I peeked at the digital clock beside my bed. It was a little after 1 a.m. My first thought after that was to go look at the stupid stairs. I hopped out of bed and walked to the top of the staircase. What I saw was ominous. There was a black haze just kind of hovering over the top of the stairs. And when I tried to scream for my mom or sister, nothing came out. I'm not sure how long I stood there, but it only felt like a few minutes. I would say, you know, maybe 10 minutes, no more. Eventually, I snapped out of it and went back to bed. I looked at the clock to see how much time I had until I needed to get up for school. It was now five o'clock in the morning. Four hours had gone by and I only had two hours left to sleep before I needed to get ready for school. That couldn't be. I told myself that I read the alarm clock wrong or something, or maybe I hit the button by accident, moving the time forward, even though I didn't remember even reaching for it. I put my head on my pillow and went back to sleep. But sure enough, two hours later, my alarm is wailing, and I can tell others were getting ready for school and work. There had been nothing wrong with the clock at all. I never spent too much time on the steps after that night. I felt like I needed to run up and down them to get off them as fast as I could. My little brother told me one day that he doesn't like to come to our room, and when I asked why, he said that he felt like he needed to run away from the steps. But here's the thing about that. I had never told anyone the story of my dream, the warning from Mary, or what I saw when I got up to inspect the stairs that night or the fact that I had lost four hours of time I couldn't account for. I didn't want people to think I was delusional or scare anybody. We were comfortable with Mary, but I figured we wouldn't be comfortable with the black ominous haze that I had seen hovering above the steps. A few more years went by and I went off to college. I was excited to get away from the unrestfulness of my house. I joined a sorority and lived in the sorority house. And of course, everybody who lives in a sorority house believes they're haunted, right? I kept my mouth shut during all the scary stories and I just thought they were stupid because I knew what it felt like. And this stuff that they were talking about, it was not it. Then the night terror started. I would wake up screaming for no reason at all. I was having more and more dreams about people who were no longer here with us. And then one night, a man who was close to my family when I was little told me in my dream that I needed to go home and pray. It sounded crazy, I know, but I did go home that weekend. That was the weekend my grandfather got into a horrible accident. He was okay, but still, I knew that was the reason that I had that foreboding feeling and that I had been visited by our family friend in my dream. Things went back to normal other than the fact that, you know, I sometimes would get these feelings. I can only call them feelings, but it's like an, an anxiety feeling. But not my anxiety like someone was with me and I could feel their worry. Now, this last bit is a little bit different, but I think it is related somewhat to my connection to Mary. Heck, maybe it was Mary, still connected to me, that decided to play a weird joke. 
Anyway, when I got my first job out of college, it was in a huge city in a new state, and when I moved, I was a little scared. That first weekend, my wallet was stolen from me at a Walmart. I freaked out. I was thousands of miles from anyone I knew. I had no ID, no credit or debit cards. Now, the credit and debit cards thing was an easy fix, but getting a new ID, it's a little bit different. I was living in a border state now, and they had very strict rules for how long you had to live there before you got an ID. I called my state, and they couldn't issue an ID without me being there. I couldn't fly home because no ID, so I had to drive, and it was a 17-hour drive that I had to look forward to. And I had to do this before the local DMV was closed. So I hopped in my car and started the drive. The last leg of my trip, I stopped for gas and I got this really weird feeling. And then it happened. My replacement debit card wouldn't work to get gas. I almost cried. I was an hour away from home and I had to make it before the DMV closed or the whole trip was worthless. I called my mom and she called the DMV to make sure that they would wait. That was great. While we focused on, you know, getting the problem with the card fixed. Was I using the right pen? Yeah, I was. Was it cracked or damaged? Or had it been by a cell phone or magnetic uh, device or something like that? No. I went in to ask if they'd take a payment over the phone. And when I got back to my car to fill up, I saw that my debit card was in my seat. I swore that I'd put it in my wallet. So I looked in and there was the replacement card in there too. And then I noticed that the numbers were not the same. The number of the card that was on my seat was different. That had been the one that had been in my wallet that was stolen from me earlier that week. I almost fainted. I told the clerk I no longer needed to pay over the phone. I used my old card which, again, was weird because I had changed out everything and it was supposed to be deactivated. But it worked. Had Mary decided to return them? And had fixed the problem? I don't know. I'm now married and still have feelings and dreams still and only occasionally see Mary. The stairs in the home that I grew up in are still heavy and I hate using them. I have no idea if Mary is a spirit or an angel or what. I'm still not sure if she's even connected to the feeling or to the other things that happened to me outside of my parents' house. More importantly, I still don't know if she is why I get strange feelings and I get these dreams that I have. It's all pretty unbelievable, I know. But it's all completely true. I grew up in an oldish house. It was built in the 1950s. Growing up, I always thought the house was a bit creepy, but I chalked it up to an overactive imagination. However, as the years passed, my family and I have continued to experience unexplainable things, and I've begun to wonder whether there isn't really something paranormal going on. Mostly, we just notice things like Lights turned on seemingly by themselves, or doors opening and closing on their own. You know, things that can be explained by faulty wiring, drafts. But there have been some other occurrences that have been less easy to explain. The first one happened when I was about 14 years old. It was only around, you know, 6 or 7 at night, but it was the middle of the winter, so it was already pitch black. My dad wasn't home from work yet, and my mom had gone to pick my older sister up from a friend's house, so I was left to watch my little sister and her friend uh, who lived down the street. I'll take this as a chance to explain a few things. First, my neighborhood was a little off the beaten trail. We weren't completely isolated, but we were a good 15-minute drive from the town where we went to school and did our shopping. Besides our line of about 10 houses, there's nothing around for another five miles but farms. At the time this happened, there were only two families in our neighborhood with school-aged children, my family and the family of my sister's friend. 
Secondly, I'll quickly explain the way my living room is set up. Our TV is up against the wall opposite the sofa. To the left of the TV, there's a window that looks out onto what we call the porch, which is a screen porch that we glassed in to make a sunroom. And to the right of the TV, there's a glass door that leads out to the porch. And behind the TV, there's a light switch that turns the porch lights on. The porch also has a glass door that leads out to the backyard. Now that we've made it through that boring setup, here's the rest of the story. Again, six or seven at night, pitch black. I'm alone uh, with my sister and her friend. All right, so the three of us were sitting there in the living room watching TV when my sister's friend suddenly sits up, looking out the window onto the porch and said, Is that Tom? Now, Tom was her older brother, who would have been about 11 back then and also living right down the street. My sister followed her gaze. Oh, yeah, Tom's here, she said. Well, I thought that was a bit odd. Normally, Tom would have come to the front door, which was on the other side of the house. We almost always left the front door open, and our families were close friends, so Tom wouldn't have hesitated to just let himself in if we hadn't heard him knocking. There really wasn't any reason for him to use the porch door. Well, I got up and looked out the glass door, thinking maybe they were just seeing things. Well, sure enough, I could see a boy, probably about 11 years old, standing on the porch. He was wearing a light sweatshirt and sweatpants, and he was just staring at the floor. I couldn't see his face super well because of the dark, but it definitely wasn't a trick of the light. There was someone out there. Assuming it was Tom, I flipped the light switch and opened the door. But when I opened the door, there wasn't anybody there. Now, I tell you this because a lot of times I tell people this story and they say it's just a reflection or you were just imagining things. Now, the figure I saw out there was so real that my first reaction wasn't fear. It was just to assume that Tom had run and hid behind the couch to jump out at me or something. Well, I stepped out onto the porch and I looked behind the couch. No one was there. I looked into the backyard to see if maybe he'd run outside. No one. And I hadn't heard a door close, you know, the door leading to the outside. I hadn't heard that close. So by now, I was naturally pretty freaked out. But seeing as I was the oldest one and I was the one in charge, I had to try and keep my cool. My sister and her friend who also both swore that they'd seen a boy standing on the porch, were getting pretty nervous. And I knew if they saw that I was scared, they'd completely lose it. So I told them it was, it was just a reflection. Yeah. I turned a few more lights on, turned the TV up really loud, and we sat quietly until my mom came home a little later. The next day I found out Tom wasn't even in the neighborhood that evening. He had left that afternoon to go on a camping trip with his Boy Scout troop. And like I said, there were no other kids in that neighborhood. Megan had just the one brother, so who or what was on our porch that night? Since then, other weird stuff has happened as well. You know, one weekend, when we were away visiting relatives, a friend of my older sister was supposed to be staying at our place watching our pets. Uh, his first night there, he sent my sister a series of frantic late-night texts saying he kept seeing and hearing things, and he had gotten so frightened that he just left. Now, this was a 21-year-old adult man, not some anxious teenager. He came back early the next morning, and the next two nights made his friend stay with him because he refused to be there alone at night. When asked about it, he was pretty vague. He just said he got really bad vibes from the place and kept seeing things. My older sister's boyfriend has also reported that on more than one occasion, he's been dropping my sister off late at night and seen a, a small figure standing in a dark window on the second floor. That window belonged to my little sister, and it was unlikely he was seeing her. You know, a lot of times, you know, they would get back at one or two in the morning, and long after Annie would have gone to sleep, and she had never been one who would just get up in the middle of the night or ever been a sleepwalker or anything like that. And if that hasn't convinced you that there was something spooky going on at my house, I'll tell you one final story. When 
My little sister first moved into that room a few years back after my other older sister had moved out. She spent the first several months refusing to sleep in there. She'd always end up in my parents' room before the night was out, and after a while, they just gave up and let her sleep with them. I didn't think much of it. She was young and had never had a room to herself before, so I figured she just didn't like being alone. Well, I later learned the reason she was so afraid to sleep in there. My parents hadn't said anything, not wanting to freak me out or make a big deal of it, but apparently she had reported to them that there was a ghost in her room. She first noticed it one morning when she was up there listening to the radio while she played with her dolls, and she heard someone whistling along to the music. I do remember this incident. I was in the kitchen with my mom when she ran downstairs screaming and crying. When my mom tried to say it must have just been part of the song, she just cried harder, insisting that was one of her favorite songs. She'd heard it a million times, and she did not remember any whistling in it. Eventually, my mom managed to calm her down, and I just kind of forgot about it. The part I didn't hear until later was that a little while after that, Annie told my mom that a girl had come to her while she was sleeping and started talking to her. She said the girl had told her her name was Miranda and she wanted to be friends. She didn't say much else, just that this had freaked her out and my parents didn't press for details. This was apparently the reason she refused to sleep in there for a good six months. I don't know what convinced her to go back to sleeping in her room, but she's since gotten over it, and she started sleeping in there. I guess Miranda's gone, or at least got the drip that Annie didn't want to be her friend. Anyway, that's the story of my creepy house. I'm in college now and live away from home, but I still go back over holidays and for part of the summer. I'll give you an update if any other paranormal goings-on happen. This has been another strange but true stories. Time to tell us what you think. Both of our stories today were sent to us by viewers and subscribers of SBT, just like you. Let us know what you thought of these in the comments below. And if you have a strange story or an occurrence in your life that you just can't put your finger on logically, well, we'd love to hear about it. Send it to us in an email with as much detail that you can remember to strange but true stories two at gmail.com. Like and subscribe and click the bell. All that stuff helps us out. Thanks for all the support from all of you and thanks for watching this video. I'm Steve White. Until next time.